Welcome back to the class of Analysis of the Facial Beauty. I'm Dr. Sretic. Today, using the knowledge about the cephalomatic landmarks and plane that we have achieved formally, we are talking about the sagittal and horizontal relationship between the constituents of the head and neck structures. Let's begin with the sagittal positional relationships. The first is the relationship of maxilla, mandible, and chin to the craniofacial skeleton. Nasian perpendicular. It is suggested by the Dr. McNamara. With the patient head oriented in NHP, natural head position, the most direct method to determine the sagittal position of the maxilla and mandible is to measure the horizontal linear distance to the nasian perpendicular, a vertical line perpendicular to the true horizontal, dropped from bony nasian. McNamara's original data was based on the Frankfurt horizontal plane rather than the true horizontal plane. Points anterior to the and perpendicular are assigned a positive value and posterior or negative value. In the white Caucasian patients, maxillary point A is on or slightly ahead on nasian perpendicular, 0 to plus 1 millimeters. Mandibular B point is 2 to 3 millimeter behind nasian perpendicular. A B difference, horizontal distance between the point A and B, when both are projected onto the true horizontal, is approximately 4 mm. Heart tissue pogonion is minus 4 to 0 mm behind the end perpendicular in adult women and minus 2 to plus 5 mm to nasion perpendicular in adult men. Facial divergence has an effect on the relationship of the maxilla and mandible to the end perpendicular. Some individuals with well-proportioned faces and normal dental occlusion may have posteriorly, usually northern Europeans, and anteriorly, usually black and far eastern ethnic backgrounds, divergent facial profiles. In individuals with posteriorly divergent profiles, point A and B may be significantly behind the end perpendicular, whereas individuals with anteriorly divergent profile point A and B may be in frontal and perpendicular. In both cases, facial profile aesthetics and dental occlusal relationships may be normal. The next topic is the projected A-B difference modified from the Burston. An important first step to use to establish whether a sagittal jaw discrepancy exists is to measure the horizontal distance between point A and B as projected onto the true horizontal plane. An A-B difference greater than 6 mm, A ahead of B, or less than minus 4 mm, B ahead of A, indicates a discrepancy. If a discrepancy is found in the A-B difference, then the position of the maxilla and mandible to the end perpendicular may be compared in order to assess which jaw is at greater fault. The original method described by Burston used the constructed Frankfurt horizontal plane rather than a true horizontal plane. The next is the craniofacial balance line and craniofacial angle by the layer. The superior cranial baseline, the layer horizontal, is constructed by joining the end point with the apex of the posterior clinoid process, PCP. The craniofacial balance line, the layer vertical, is a vertical line constructed from just posterior to M, perpendicular to the delayer horizontal line, and determines the sagittal position of the maxilla and mandibular skeletal base. In an ideal phase, the delay vertical line runs through the, the nasopalatine foramen, determines the sagittal position of the maxilla and root of the maxillary canine at the junction of the apical and middle thirds indicates the sagittal position of the maxillary dental alveolus 
An apex of the mandibular incisors indicate the sagittal position of the mandibular deltoid alveolus. And finally, the menton determines the sagittal position of the mandible. The craniofacial angle is posterior inferior angle formed by the intersection of the delayer vertical and horizontal lines. It helps to determine the sagittal position of the maxillary and mandibular skeletal bases relative to the cranial base. Normal Caucasian adult values are the male is 90 degree and the female is the 85 to 90 degrees. Moving on to the next section, the relationship of maxilla, mandible, and the chin to the cranial base. The angles SNA and SNB were originally described by the orthodontist Richard R. Riedel and form a part of the Steiner cephalometric analysis and introduced by the orthodontist Cecil Steiner. SNA angle relates the sagittal position of the maxillary apical base A point to the anterior cranial base SN. The SNA angle provides an indication of the sagittal position of the maxilla relative to the anterior cranial base. The average value of the SNA angle in Caucasian adult is 82 degree plus minus 3 degrees. On the other hand, the S and B angle relates the sagittal position of the mandibular apical base B point to the anterior cranial base SN. The S and B angle provides an indication of the sagittal position of the mandible relative to the anterior cranial base. The average value of the S and B angle in Caucasian adult is the 79 degree plus minus 3 degrees. Mm -hmm. When assessing the sagittal jaw position using the angles SNA and SNB, the following factors must be borne in mind. The first is the variation in A point and B point. Although the angles in SNB and SNA provide a good indication of the relative sagittal position of the mandible and maxilla, it must be emphasized that A and B points are alveolar points and do not necessarily represent the true position of the skeletal basis. In addition, these points may vary with growth and due to the alveolar bone remodeling that may occur with the orthodontic treatment changes in the inclination of the incisor teeth. Nevertheless, the angle SNA and SNB gives a useful indication of degree of prognathism and retrognathism of the jaw at any one time. The variation in the position or orientation of the SN plane in patients with dentofacial and craniofacial deformities, there is always the possibility of deviation from the norm in the inclination or sagittal cant of the cranial base as well as in the position of the jaws. Therefore, abnormal cephalometric measurements relating the jaw to the cranial base may be due to deviations in the cranial base, the position of the cella, nasion, or both, rather than in the position of the maxilla or mandible. The normal inclination of SN plane to the frontward horizontal plane, or ideally the true horizontal plane, is around 6 to 7 degree. The SNA and SNB angles may only be used if the SN plane is normally oriented or after correction for the inclination of the SN plane to the true horizontal plane. If nasion is more forward in the position, the SNA angle is decreased and vice versa. Therefore, in the circumstances, the angle A and B may be adjusted to some extent as follows. For every one degree that angle SNA is below the average value of the 82 degree, 0.5 degree is added to the angle of A and B. For every one degree that is, is above the average, subtract 0.5 degree from the angle A and B. Variations in the vertical position of cella will affect the values of angle SNA and SNB, but not the angle A and B. Effect of the facial divergence on SNA and SNB Variations in the sagittal position of the points A and B may be due to the general slope of the face, in other words, facial divergence. In a posteriorly divergent face, the SNA and SNB angles will be reduced from the average and in an anteriorly divergent phase, the angles will be increased from the average.
However, the SNA and SMB difference or A and B angle should remain average. SND angle. Its average value is 76 to 77 degree. The SND angle was described by the Steiner. Point D is the center of the body of the symphysis and is estimated visually. The SND angle provides an assessment of the sagittal position of the mandibular skeletal base in relation to the anterior cranial base. Although the angle SNB is often used to provide an indication of sagittal position of the mandible, point B is actually a dental alveolar and not a skeletal point. Therefore, the angle SNB demonstrates the position of the mandibular dental alveolar process, apical base, to the anterior cranial base, whereas the angle SND more accurately expresses the relationship of the mandibular skeletal base to the anterior cranial base. The next is SN Pogonian angle. Its average is known to be 80 degree plus minus 3 degree. This angle is formed between the most anterior point on the bony chin, as known as the pogonion, and the SN plane. It is important to compare the value of SNB and SN pogonion. In patients with well-developed chin but mandibular dental alveolar apical base retrusion, the facial profile may be acceptable even though the dental alveolar relationship is unfavorable. This relationship is common in class 2 division 2 type case. If SN pogonion is smaller than SNB, the patient is likely to have an excessive recessive bony chin in the sagittal plane. In analyzing the sagittal position of the mandible, it is inaccurate and imprecise to place undue reliance on any single measurement due to anatomical variations of the anterior aspect of the mandible its dental alveolar processes and the chin. The angle SNB, SND, and SN pogonion must be assessed in order to compare the sagittal position of the dental alveolar process, mandibular skeletal base, and chin, respectively. The next is the cranial base, saddle angle. Its average is known to 130 degree plus minus 5 degree. The saddle angle is so termed as the angle centers at cella which is the midpoint of the cella turcica. It is Latin for Turkish saddle. The saddle angle, NS basian, is the angle formed between the anterior and posterior cranial base. It is effectively a measure of the bend between the anterior and posterior cranial base. It is measured as the anterior inferior angle formed by the intersection of the SN line, which represents the anterior cranial base, and the S basian line, which represents the posterior cranial base. An increased saddle angle indicates the posterior position of the glenoid fossa and the mandibular condyle, thereby a posteriorly positioned mandible, so mandibular retrognathia, in relation to the cranial base, unless compensated by a more acute gonial angle and increased mandibular length conversely. A reduced saddle angle indicates an anterior position of the glenoid fossa and mandibular condyle thereby leading to mandibular prognathism, unless compensated by an increased gonial angle and reduced mandibular length. If Bayesian is difficult to identify on lateral cephalometry radiographs, articulaire may be used instead. Normal value for NS articulaire is 125 degree plus minus 5 degrees. Okay, moving on to the relationship of maxilla to mandible, as known as skeletal pattern. The sagittal relationship of the mandible to the maxilla may be described as a skeletal class 1, 2, or 3. The skeletal class 1 means the maxillary and mandibular skeletal basis in a normal sagittal relationship to one another. The maxillary skeletal base is 2 or 3 mm anterior to the mandibular skeletal base. Skeletal class 2 means that there is a relative maxillary prominence in the sagittal plane. In other words, in occlusion, the mandible is positioned further back in relation to the maxilla than in skeletal class 1. Skeletal class 3 means 
there is a relative mandibular prominence in the sagittal plane. In other words, in occlusion, the mandible is positioned further forward in relation to the maxilla than in skeletal class 1. It must be noted that the skeletal class relates the maxillary and mandibular skeletal bases to each other and not to the face. In other words, the classification skeletal class 3 does not define whether the mandible is prognathic, the maxilla retrognathic, or combination of the two. An indication of the range of severity of class 3 and class 2 relationship is provided by the A and B angle. A and B angle of average value 3 degree plus minus 1 degree. The A and B angle represents the difference between the SNA and SNB angles, providing an indication of the sagittal discrepancy between the maxillary and mandibular apical basis. The A and B angle is positive if point A lies anterior to NB. If NA and NB coincide, the A and B angle is zero. If point A lies positive to NB, A and B will be negative. The skeletal pattern is described as the class 1 means the A and B angle is in the range of the 2 to 4 degree. The class 2 means the A and B angle is greater than 4 degree. The class 3 means the A and B angle is less than 2 degree. When assessing sagittal skeletal pattern using the angle A and B, the following factors must be borne in mind. First, Anatomical variation in the position of nasion. Variation in the position of nasion may give misleading value of A and B angle. Second, the influence of vertical face height on A and B. With the same A and B angle, the greater the anterior face height, the larger the sagittal distance between A point and B point due to greater divergence of the NA and NB lines from nasion. Third, relationship of A and B angle and dental occlusion. The sagittal occlusion and skeletal relationship do not always match and must be assessed independently of one another. An apical base relationship beyond the normal range may be associated with a normal class 1 dental occlusion if there has been a dental alveolar compensation for understanding skeletal pattern. Conversely, occlusion male relationship may occur on a normal skeletal class 1 pattern if the dental inclinations are unfavorable. The last, the influence of sagittal rotation of the maxillomandibular complex on angle A and B. Sagittal rotation of the maxillomandibular complex around the transverse axis will have an effect on relative position of A and B points to nasion. Forward, in other words, anti-clockwise rotation will have a decreasing effect on the A and B angle. Conversely, backward or clockwise rotation will have an increasing effect on A and B angle. Such rotation do not have an effect on occlusal relationship or width appraisal. The A and B angle relates the position of the jaw to nasion, which is a structure outside of maxillomandibular complex. There are two methods to assess the sagittal relationship of the jaw to one another without consideration of outside structures, the balance conversion method and the width appraiser. The first is a balance conversion. This method was devised by the orthodontist Clifford Ballard and uses the incisor overjet as the indicator of the relative position of the maxilla to the mandible. The aim is to eliminate any dental alveolar compensation for the underlying skeletal pattern by correcting the inclination of the incisor to their ideal inclination. The residual incisor overjet is thereby used as an indicator of the sagittal skeletal discrepancy. The method is useful as an indicator of sagittal skeletal discrepancy but becomes less reliable if vertical skeletal discrepancies are also present. In addition, the accepted norms used for incisor inclination and the mandibular plane angle must be athenistically specific. The main drawbacks of this method are the difficulty in tracing the roots of the incisor teeth, particularly the mandibular incisor, and the assumption that the incisor have the fixed root centroid positioned approximately one-third to one-half of the root length from the root apex. The second is the width appraisal. 
Another method used to describe the relationship of the jaw to each other is the wit's appraisal originally described by the Jenkins and later popularized by Jacobson. The procedure involves the constructing perpendicular from maxillary A point and mandibular B point to the functional occlusal plane. The functional occlusal plane drawn through the region of the overlapping cusp of the first permanent molars and the premolars establishing the point AO and BO respectively and measuring the distance along the functional occlusal plane between the points AO and BO. The linear measurement between AO and BO provides an indication of sagittal discrepancy between the maxilla and mandible. The mean values are in female BO and AO coincide. Its range is about 0 plus minus 2 millimeters. In male, BO is 1 mm ahead of AO. Its range is around minus 1 plus minus 2 mm degrees. Males are slightly more class 3 than females. The figure shown in the screen shows effect of class 2 pattern and the effect of skeletal class 3 pattern on the width's reading. The greater the width reading deviates from the minus 1 mm in man and 0 mm in woman, the greater the extent of the sagittal skeletal discrepancy. The advantage of this technique are its simplicity and that it is not influenced by the cranial base. The drawback is that the functional occlusal plane is not easy to locate and variation in its orientation will affect the estimate of the skeletal pattern from the AO and BO projection to it. Now moving on to the size relationship of maxilla and mandible. The first is the ratio of the midfascial to the mandibular lengths. The orthodontist Agil P. Havard initially developed the standards for the unit lengths of the maxilla and mandible using data from the Burlington Growth Study of the University of Toronto. The difference between the maxillary and mandibular unit lengths provides an indication of the size discrepancy between the jaws. The analysis was subsequently developed as part of the McNamara analysis using data derived from the Bolton Growth Study in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Midfacial unit lengths. It is measured from the condylion to lower ANS defined as the point of the lower shadows of the anterior nasal spine where the projecting spine is 3 mm thick. Midfacial is a more accurate term than maxillary in this context as condylion is a point of the mandible. Mandibular unit length. It is defined and measured from the condylion to nathion. Midfacial mandibular length differential. It is determined by the subtracting the midfacial lengths from the mandibular lengths. This size differential will depend on the stature of the individual. In small individuals, the difference should be 20 to 24 millimeters. In medium-sized individuals, the difference should be 25 to 28 millimeters. In large individuals, the difference should be 29 to 33 millimeters. It must be stressed that the term small, medium, and large essentially correspond to the mixed dentition, adult female and adult male, respectively. However, the terms small, medium, and large are preferred due to the inherent variations in size and statures in individuals of different age and sex. The screen demonstrates the relationship between the midfacial lengths, effectively maxillary lengths, and mandibular lengths and lower anterior facial height. Any specific midfacial length will correspond to a specific mandibular length and lower anterior facial height within a given range. This relationship is generally linear and depends on the size rather than the age of or sex of the individual. The next part will cover the sagittal dental alveolar relationships. The term sagittal skeletal pattern refers to the sagittal relationship of the basal bone of the maxilla and mandible. The alveolar bone, which invests the teeth, thereby forming the dental alveolar process, is supported by the basal bone. However, the sagittal relationship between the maxillary and mandibular dental alveolar processes is not necessarily the same as the between their respective basal bones.
dental alveolar position may, to a limited extent, be independent of its supporting basal bone and skeletal relationship. The reason is that tooth position is not determined entirely by jaw position. Other factors, in particular those related to the soft tissue environment of the teeth, may cause the teeth to erupt and or move away from their correct inclinations. The alveolar bone develops to support the teeth and therefore may be within a limited range, slightly different in position from the basal bone. It is necessary to determine both the inclination and sagittal position of the incisal teeth in relation to the craniofacial complex. Inclination of the maxillary incisor The inclination of the maxillary incisor is important both in terms of occlusal function and dental facial aesthetics. The long axis of the maxillary incisor from the incisor tip to the root apex is drawn and extended to meet the reference plane from which the incisor inclination may be measured. The reference planes that may be used are the maxillary plane, Frankfurt horizontal plane, and SM plane. As these reference planes are all subject to biological variability, incisor inclinations measured in this way should be interpreted with caution. Ideally, the incisor inclination should be determined using more than one reference plane and the orientation of the respective reference plane to the craniofacial skeleton must also be determined to be within normal limits. The first is the maxillary incisor to maxillary plane inclination. This is perhaps the most commonly employed value to determine maxillary incisor inclination. The result may be interpreted with caution as it will depend on three separate factors. The first is the inclination of the maxillary incisor. The values greater or lesser than the normal range demonstrate the proclination or retroclination of the maxillary incisors. Second, crown root angle. If there is an unusually acute maxillary incisor crown root angle, this may lead to an incorrect evaluation of the maxillary incisor inclination. The third is the inclination of the maxillary plane. The inclination of the maxillary plane, sagittal rotation around the transverse axis, will affect the maxillary incisor to maxillary plane inclination. For example, if the posterior nasal spine is canted upward posteriorly, the value of maxillary incisor to maxillary plane inclination will be increased. The next item is the maxillary incisor to cella nasal plane inclination. The long axis of the maxillary incisor is extended to intersect the ascent plane and the posterior angle is measured. Again, the maxillary incisor crown root in angle and the orientation of the ascent plane must be taken into account. Maxillary incisor to Frankfurt horizontal plane. The long axis of the maxillary incisor is extended to intersect the Frankfurt horizontal plane and the posterior angle is measured. Again, the maxillary incisor crown root angle and the inclination of the Frankfurt horizontal plane must be taken into account. The final item is the maxillary incisor to NA line. Steiner related the relative position of the inclination of the maxillary incisor to the nasion point A NA line. The most anterior point of the maxillary incisors should be 4 mm ahead of the NA line. This relates the sagittal position of the incisor to maxilla. The sagittal position of the maxilla to the craniofacial complex must therefore be assessed using another analysis. Maxillary incisor actual inclination is 22 degree to NA line. Moving on to the sagittal position of the maxillary incisor. The sagittal position of the maxillary incisor to maxilla may be assessed using Steiner NA line described before. Important analysis to assess the sagittal position of the maxillary incisor to the craniofacial complex are as follows. First is the maxillary incisor to N perpendicular. In McNamara analysis, a vertical line is drawn through the maxillary A point parallel to the N perpendicular and perpendicular to the Frankfurt horizontal plane or ideally true horizontal plane. The labial or facial surface of the maxillary incisor should be 4 to 6 mm ahead of the line. 
The second is the maxillary incisor to a pogonian line in Down's analysis. The protrusion of the maxillary incisors may be measured as the distance between the incisor edge of the maxillary incisor to the point A to pogonian line. It is notable that Down's credited rickets with suggesting that the position of the mandibular incisors to the apogonion was important in aesthetics of the lower face. The apogonion line was popularized by Williams, which is termed the diagnostic line. Moving on to the inclination of the mandibular incisors, we can use several items to evaluate it. The first is the mandibular incisor to mandibular plane. Its average is known to 92 degree plus minus 5 degree. The average value and the range of the variation given are only appropriate if the maxillary mandibular plane angles and the skeletal patterns are within the normal range. Regarding skeletal pattern, the patient with acceptable facial soft tissue aesthetics may have an underlying class 2 or class 3 skeletal pattern. In such patients, dental alveolar compensation will be a favorable feature permitting an acceptable dental occlusion despite the skeletal discrepancy. Therefore, the mandibular incisor inclination should always be interpreted with reference to the skeletal pattern. Regarding maxillary mandibular plane angle, it is abbreviated MMPA or MM angle. If the MMPA is increased, there tends to be a compensatory retroclination of the mandibular incisors. Conversely, in low angle patients, the mandibular incisor may be proclined. Therefore, there is an inverse relationship between the MMPA and the mandibular incisor to mandibular plane angle. A useful check is that the MMPA plus mandibular incisor to mandibular plane angle should be equal to 112 degree. Hence, for every degree the MMPA exceeds its average value, the expected value of the mandibular incisor inclination should be reduced by 1 degree and vice versa. The next item is the mandibular incisor to Frankfurt horizontal plane. This angle relates the axial inclination of the mandibular incisor to the Frankfurt horizontal plane, which avoids any variation due to the inclination of the mandibular plane. Frankfurt mandibular incisor angle Charles Tweed described the Frankfurt mandibular incisor angle, briefly the FMIA, as part of the Tweed triangles. It is the inferior posterior angle formed by the intersection of the long axis of the mandibular central incisors and the Frankfurt horizontal plane. Normal values are 62 to 70 degrees. Mandibular incisors to NB plane. The actual inclination of the mandibular central incisor to the nasion B point NB line should be 25 degrees. It is suggested by the Sechel Steiner. Moving on to the sagittal position of the mandibular incisors. Mandibular incisor to NB plane. The most labial portion of the crown of the mandibular central incisors should be located 4 mm ahead of the NB line. It is also suggested by this acyl steiner. The next item is the mandibular incisor to a pogonian line. It is suggested by the downs. This is the perpendicular distance of the mandibular central incisor edge to the apogonian line. It represents the degree of the mandibular incisor protrusion in relation to the lower face. In individuals with good dental alveolar aesthetics and good dental occlusions, the mandibular incisor edge lies on or close to the apogonian line. It is important to bear in mind that the orientation of the apogonian line is influenced by the sagittal position of the maxillary A point and the prominence of the chin. The final item is mandibular incisor edge to the maxillary incisors and through the relationship. This is measured as the distance between the perpendicular projections of the mandibular incisor edge and the centroid of the maxillary incisor root onto the maxillary plane.
the mandibular inside the edge projection should be coincident with or up to 2 mm ahead of the centroid projection. This relationship is closely associated with the incisor overbite depth in that the further posterior to the centroid the mandibular incisor edge lies, the deeper the overbite is likely to be unless there is an incomplete overbite. Correction of this relationship with the orthodontic treatment is an important factor in overbite stability. Okay, let's continue with the inclination of the maxillary to the mandibular incisors. The interincisor angle, which is known as the normal value of the 133 degree plus minus 10 degree, was described by the William Downs and is the posterior angle formed by the intersection of the long axis of the maxillary and mandibular central incisors. When there is an incisor contact, the interincisor angle is associated with the depth of the incisor overbite. In other words, the incisor teeth tends to erupt past one another if the interincisor angle is increased, resulting in a deep overbite. It is notable that a simple geometrical relationship exists in that the sum of the maxillary mandibular plane angle and maxillary incisor to maxillary plane inclination, mandibular incisor to mandibular plane inclination, and interincisor angle should be 360 degrees. Okay. We are now moving on to the vertical sclerectal relationship. There is no single cephalometric variable that reliably distinguishes normal from vertically abnormal individuals. In order to accurately evaluate vertical proportions, it is necessary to analyze both linear, anterior, and posterior vertical dimensions compared to age, sex, and ethnicity-specific normative data and as proportional relationships and angular measurement comparing posterior and the anterior vertical dimension. First topic we should discuss is the convergence of the horizontal facial plane, which is treated in detail in Sassoni analysis. The orthodontist Vikens Sassoni described the importance of the analyzing the relative orientation of the horizontal planes of the face. He described four planes, the supraorbital plane, palatal plane, occlusal plane, mandibular plane. Sassoni explained that the most frequent tendency is for the planes to converge posteriorly towards a common center, which is termed center O. This center would be located as the center of an area of 15 mm diameter within which pass the planes. If any one plane is out of convergence to an extent that it passes outside this area, that plane and its associated structures is vertically out of proportion. A slightly modified version of this analysis may be employed utilizing the following five horizontal facial planes, the anterior cranial base plane, the true horizontal plane or Frankfurt horizontal plane, maxillary plane, occlusal plane, mandibular plane. In a well-proportioned face, these horizontal facial planes should converge symmetrically towards an approximate area of intersection located near the occiput back of the skull. If any part of the face is vertically disproportionate, its associate plane will not converge with the others. Examination of the relationship among these horizontal planes reveals several distinct patterns. Sestal position of the area of convergence. If the area of the convergence of the horizontal facial plane is positioned well behind the occiput, the planes will be nearly parallel. This character pattern is associated with similar anterior and posterior facial heights and correlates with a deep bite tendency, which Sassoni termed as a skeletal deep bite. In other words, an increased incisor overbite etiologically related to the parallelism of the horizontal skeletal planes. If the area of convergence of the horizontal facial plane is positioned in front of the occiput toward the face, the plane will be diverged anteriorly. The skeletal pattern is associated with markedly different anterior and posterior facial heights and correlate with an anterior open bite tendency, which Sassoni termed 
a skeletal open byte, in other words, an anterior open byte, etiologically related to the divergence of the horizontal skeletal plane. Sagittal jaw rotation. The direction and extent of the sagittal rotation around the transverse axis of the maxilla, mandible, or maxillomandibular complex may be gleaned by the inclination of the maxillary and the mandibular plane that deviates from the area of intersection of the other planes. For example, patients with a posterior vertical maxillary excess may have a maxilla that is canted down posteriorly. The next is the anterior and posterior facial height. With the lateral cephalometry radiograph taken in natural head position, the true vertical plane may be recorded on the radiograph by means of the plumb line. A number of vertical lines may be drawn parallel to the true vertical from a variety of points such as a nasion and cella. True horizontal plane may then be drawn perpendicular to the true vertical through a variety of points such as a nasion, ANS, and mantum. The dentoskeletal structures may be related ideally to the true vertical and horizontal planes using angular and linear measurement. These measurements may be compared with population norms and used to analyze a range of proportional relationships. Anterior facial height ratio. It is a proportional relationship of lower to middle anterior facial height. Horizontal lines are projected from the N, ANS, and Menton onto the true vertical. The middle anterior facial height, MAFH, is the measure from the projection of N to the ANS. The lower anterior facial height, RAFH, is measured from the projection of the ANS to that of Menton. The proportional relationship of the MAFH and LAFH is approximately 45 to 55%. This proportional relationship is more important than any absolute measurement. It is notable that the facial soft tissue proportion of the middle to lower anterior face height measured clinically is 50 to 50. The reason that the skeletal proportion is not 50 to 50 when measured cephalometrically is that the uppermost point is nasion. If heart tissue glabella on the frontal bone horizontally in the same position as the soft tissue glabella was used instead of nasion, the proportion would be 50-50. The next is the relationship of anterior to posterior facial height. Facial height index, briefly FHI, means the proportional relationship of the anterior to posterior lower face height. The lower posterior face height LPFH is measured from articular tangent to the ascending mandibular ramus to the mandibular plane. This may more accurately be referred to as the posterior ramus height, excluding the condyle. The lower anterior facial height LAFH is measured from the maxillary plane to menton. The FHI is the ratio of LAFH to LPFH and should be from 0.65 to 0.75. Hence, if the lower posterior facial height is less than 65% or more than 75% of the lower anterior face height, there is likely to be a vertical skeletal discrepancy. The FHI must be analyzed in conjunction with the anterior face height ratio. For example, if the anterior facial height ratio MAFH to LAFH is correct but the FHI is not, then the discrepancy lies in the LPFH. In other words, there is a reduced vertical ramus height. We should consider angular relationship of the anterior to posterior facial height using the relationship of the anterior to posterior face height. The maxillary mandibular plane angle is largely determined by the ratio of anterior and posterior intermaxillary heights. The maxillary and mandibular plane angles are known to have 27 degree plus minus 5 degree in normal populations. It is formed by the intersection of the maxillary plane, ANS to PNS, and the mandibular plane, gonion to nathion. Steiner assessed the steepness of the mandibular plane in relation to SN plane. 
Downs described the mandibular plane angle as the angle formed by the intersection of the frankfurt Kreisner plane and the mandibular plane. This angle may be assessed both clinically and cephalometrically. These variables may be assessed with an independent estimate of the lower anterior face height, such as the anterior facial height ratio. Okay, now move on to the vertical dental alveolar relationships. In order to evaluate the vertical position of the teeth relative to their respective skeletal base, it is necessary to assess the inclination of the occlusal plane, the distance of the maxillary incisors and posterior maxillary dentition to the maxillary plane, and finally, the distance of the mandibular incisors and posterior mandibular dentitions to mandibular plane. First, we will discuss the inclination of the occlusal plane. This should be harmonious with the other skeletal planes as described in the Sassoni analysis. Traditionally, the occlusal plane is drawn from the first molar to the incisor overlap. Although the occlusal plane along the line of the posterior occlusion tends to be straight, it is subject to considerable variation anteriorly depending on the incisor relationship and curve of speed. This may also be evident by assessing the maxillary and mandibular occlusal plane. The maxillary occlusal plane is a line joining the cusp tip of the maxillary first permanent molars to the incisor edges of the maxillary central incisors. On the other hand, the mandibular occlusal plane is a line joining the cusp tips of the mandibular first molar to the incisor edges of the mandibular central incisors. A more accurate assessment of dental vertical relationships may be obtained by using the functional occlusal plane. A line drawn through the occlusal surfaces of the maxillary and mandibular first permanent molars and premolars, in other words, along the line of dental occlusion. The next is the anterior maxillary dental height. Anterior maxillary dental height is measured from the maxillary incisor tip to the maxillary plane. In male, the normal value is 28 plus minus 3 millimeters. In female, 27 plus minus 3 millimeters. An increase in this dimension may be indicative of excessive eruption of maxillary incisors, such as in class 2 division 2 metaclusion or anterior vertical maxillary excess. A decrease in this dimension may occur in patients with an anterior open bite or soft tissue etiology or those with prolonged digit sucking habits where the anterior vertical incisor eruption has been impeded. The next is the posterior maxillary dental height. Posterior maxillary dental height is measured from the mesial buccal cusp tip of the maxillary first molar to the maxillary plane. In male, normal value is 27 plus minus 3 millimeters, and in females, the normal value is 24 plus minus 3 millimeters. An increase in this dimension may be due to the posterior vertical maxillary excess. In addition, the roots of the maxillary molars should be at or no more than 3 mm inferior to the height of the palatal vault. The next is the anterior mandibular dental height. Anterior mandibular dental height is measured from the mandibular incisor tip to the inferior border of the mandible. In male, the normal value is 40 plus minus 3 mm. In female, the normal value is 38 plus minus 3 millimeters. An increase in this dimension may be indicative of excessive eruption of the mandibular incisor teeth and or OR increase the vertical chin height. A decrease in this dimension may be due to impeded eruption of the mandibular incisor teeth or reduced vertical chin height. The finally, we could consider posterior mandibular dental height. Posterior mandibular dental height is measured from the mesial buccal cusp tip of the mandibular first molar to the mandibular plane. In male, the normal value is 34 plus minus 3 millimeters, and in female, the normal value is, is 33 plus minus 3 millimeters. Finally, we could talk about the transverse character relationships. When evaluating the transverse, or with these dimensions of the face, 
Much of the most valuable diagnostic information is obtained from the clinical frontal facial analysis. Individuals presenting with significant facial asymmetry will require further assessment of the underlying dentoskeletal structures using posterior anterior cephalometric radiograph and, where necessary, three-dimensional imaging. Comprehensive evaluation of the transverse dimensions, including analysis of posterior anterior cephalometric radiograph, is described as well. This is the end of today's lectures. Thanks for watching. See you next week.